ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the big dog, Hutch. All right, thanks, Ryan. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. If you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, find your way over to the book of Exodus, chapter 7. should be pretty easy. It's the second book in the Bible. Chapter 7 is not that far in. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time. We're going to be in some other passages of Scripture this morning, but uh, uh, that's where we're going to focus most of our attention. Question for you this morning. Is the devil real? And if he is real, what is he about in this world that you and I need to be aware of as followers of Christ and ready for? Well, we're going to go back about 3,500 years this morning to our good friend Moses and find the answers to that and many other questions. Uh, you're in Exodus 7. Now, go back a couple of chapters, if you will, to Exodus 5 as we begin. Just by way of introduction, you'll remember that Moses was that, that baby that was miraculously spared the king's edict of murder. Not only was he miraculously spared from that edict of murder, but he was also adopted into the king's very own household. And for the first 40 years of his life, he lived in the palace with the king. But something didn't seem right. At about the age of 40, he had a sense of God's mission and purpose for his life. And he kind of jumped the gun a little bit by killing an Egyptian soldier who was, uh, who was uh, beating on a slave. He ended up spending the next 40 years in the seminary of solitude on the backside of the desert. And there God was still continuing to mold and shape him to prepare him for the destiny that he had for him. Turn the clock forward at the end of those 40 years. He's minding his own business. He sees something quite unusual, a bush that was burning. That wasn't unusual. The fact that the bush did not burn up was unusual. He turns aside to see what's going on. God speaks to him from out of the midst of the bush, gives him a very clear message, a very clear destiny, a very clear calling to his life. And now Moses is fulfilling that calling. Fast forward, if you will, to chapter 5. He's down with his brother Aaron. and he's standing before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And he gives him God's ultimatum. Exodus 5 and verse 2. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go. And then notice these next few words. Probably the most impactful, profound, negative words that could ever be pinned on a piece of paper. I do not know the Lord. Pharaoh says, I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Fast forward, chapter 7, verse 3. But I, God says, will harden Pharaoh's heart. When we read those words, oftentimes we have a problem with that. Why would God harden Pharaoh's heart? That doesn't seem like the kind and gracious God we've come to know. But God has a purpose in everything that he does. As we read through this text, we will see that not only does God harden Pharaoh's heart, but Pharaoh hardens Pharaoh's heart. And we see in this text, but I, God says, will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Basically, what God is saying here is that he wants Pharaoh to resist him so that he, God, can display his power in such a magnificent and undeniable way that he will answer that question that Pharaoh has asked, who is God? that I should obey him. God's going to answer this question so clearly, so concisely, so profoundly, and so powerfully that Pharaoh and everyone in the land of Egypt will not soon forget it. And so Moses and Aaron now go into Pharaoh's presence for a second time. Exodus 7 and verse 8. Follow along in your notes. 
Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. Now, you remember, Moses and Aaron have already been in Pharaoh's presence and Pharaoh kicked him out. So they can't very likely easily just go in a second time, have the exact same spiel, if you will. And so they need something a little extra. They need something with some oomph. They need something with some teeth to grab Pharaoh's attention. And so God gives them a sign. God gives them a miracle. Exodus 7, verse 10. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord had commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Now, what's interesting here is that the word in Hebrew for serpent that's translated here in verse 10 is not the normal word for serpent or snake. This word, it, it, it conveys a monstrous snake, a mean and nasty snake. It's a word that almost describes a cross between a python and a crocodile. You get the picture? Verse 11. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. Each one of Pharaoh's sorcerers did the exact same thing that Moses and Aaron did. We don't know how many sorcerers there were. Over in the New Testament, we have two of them that are named by name. But it may have been two. It may have been six. It may have been a dozen. It may have been a hundred. We don't know how many sorcerers Pharaoh called in. But what they did was took a staff, threw it to the ground, and it becomes a snake. Now, all of a sudden, Pharaoh's palace office is filled with writhing, slithering, hissing snakes. Why did Pharaoh do this? Pharaoh wanted to prove that the false gods of Egypt were equal to the task. That the God of Moses and Aaron was, was really not all that special. And at first glance, it looked like Egypt won. If you're in the room this day, you see this one big monstrous snake, that's impressive. But now there are several, maybe dozens, maybe hundreds of other snakes there in this room. It looked like Egypt had won. Moses and Aaron, one snake. Pharaoh sorcerers, many snakes but it's not over yet. Verse 12. For each man cast down his staff and they became serpents, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Right in front of Moses, right in front of Aaron, right in front of Pharaoh, right in front of all of the sorcerers, Moses and Aaron's serpent swallows up all of the other snakes. Now, it was not because Moses and Aaron's serpent was particularly hungry that day. What God was doing in this moment in time was showing his supremacy to the false gods of Egypt. And the truth of the matter is that that is the singular purpose for the reason why God sent the next 10 plagues that we'll eventually see unleashed on Egypt. He wants to systematically prove to Pharaoh and the Egyptian people that the living God of Israel is superior to the demon gods of Egypt, verse 13. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. 
Now, what really happened here? Did these sorcerers do the exact same thing that Moses and Aaron did? Most commentators say no. Most commentators you read try to reason this away. A lot of them will say, well, these sorcerers had hypnotized these snakes they become rigid. They hit them inside of their garments, and when the time came, they woke them up, and they did what snakes do. That's some pretty stupid sorcerers to be carrying around sleepy snakes in their undergarments. The Bible tells us exactly how they did what they did. And it tells us in verse 11, they did it, verse 11, by means of their secret arts. The Hebrew word here is the word for sorcery, witchcraft, demonic power. They did it by demonic power, by the power of Satan himself. Now, I know what you may be thinking this morning. You say, Hutch, I got to be honest with you. I've seen you up there a few times. You seem like a reasonable guy. You seem like you've got some education. Do you really believe that there is a devil in a red suit with horns, a pitchfork, and a pointy tail running around this world? And my answer to you this morning is yes, I do. I don't know about the red suit, the horns, the pitchfork, and the tail. But you and I have a very real enemy. It's the same enemy that is the enemy of God. You say, Hutch, how do you know that? Number one, I know it because of God's word. But number two, I know it because I have seen evil face to face. In this week's article, I wrote about the very first time I dealt with this. As a young man right out of college. I can still see it in my mind's eyes. I walked into that room, and this woman's arms and legs were covered with carvings that she had inflicted upon herself. She could say the word Jesus, and she could say the word Lord, but she could not say Jesus is Lord. I saw it several years later. I've told this story many times. When a 16-year-old student of mine walked into the classroom where he was to be seated, only this time, after having shot and killed one teacher, having shot an assistant principal twice, he walked into our room, pulled his gun, and said to one of the students, by name, this is for you, I'm going to kill you. I saw evil in his face. The Bible assures us of the reality of the person and the power of Satan. And you cannot pick and choose the parts of the Bible that you want to believe is true and the other parts is not. It's either all true or none of it is true. And when you look at history, men like Hitler, Stalin, Charles Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, you would be hard pressed to convince anyone that there is not some presence of supernatural evil in this world. The Bible says that there is. As a matter of fact, the Bible gives us Satan's biography in Isaiah chapter 14. We're not going to elaborate on that because we don't have time. But what we do discover there is that his original name was Lucifer. He was the most powerful of all of the angels. 
He attended God in his very presence, and something began to happen deep and dark inside of Lucifer's heart. He saw the worship that was being given to God, and he said, I want a piece of that. Not only do I want a piece of that, I want all of that. And he led a rebellion against God, and God cast him out of heaven. And one-third of the angels that he had convinced to follow him And they became God's mortal enemy. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, look at your notes, verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed in the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. That's exactly what's happening here in Exodus chapter 7. Here is Satan through the sorcerers standing toe-to-toe with Moses and Aaron trying to oppose everything that God is doing in Egypt. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, what difference does that really make? So what if there's a, an evil entity in this world called Satan? What does that have to do with me? How does that impact my life? What was... What was Satan trying to do there that day in Pharaoh's presence? He was trying to deceive Pharaoh. He was trying to say to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, you don't need to listen to this God of Moses and Aaron. You don't have to pay attention to anything he says. And if you don't do what he says, you don't have to worry about any penalty. And deception has been Satan's game plan from the very beginning. All you have to do is go back and read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And it sets the stage. Well, I'll take the time to read it this morning for sake of time. But you remember the scenario, right? Has God said that you shall not eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden? Did God really say that? Well, God didn't, he may have said that, but the reason why he said that, you know, is because he doesn't want you to be like him. And he deceived Eve, and Eve convinced Adam, and that's why we're in the mess we're in today. He succeeded at deceiving them. 2 Thessalonians, again, chapter 2, verse 9 this time. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. He wants to, believe, he wants to deceive those who are unbelieving. Satan has a twofold mission. You'll want to write this down. Part number one of his mission is to deceive every non-believing person on earth and to convince them to reject Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation. To convince people that Jesus isn't really who he claimed to be, which is, of course, God in the flesh. To convince people that Jesus isn't the one and only exclusive way to heaven. To convince people, just like Pharaoh, You can ignore everything that that God says without worrying about any consequence or penalty. And if you're here today, under the sound of my voice, and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your real and personal Savior, Satan is out to convince you, you don't need to do that. You're a good guy. Your good works outweigh your bad works, right? I mean, listen, there was a time where you held the door open for a lady in a wheelchair. What in the world? You deserve heaven for that. There was that day at the party where you chose the angel food cake over the devil's food cake. You're good. You're better than him. Certainly better than him and way better than him. 
And he used every means possible to try to deceive us, to convince us. And what I want to tell you today is that's a lie. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. How do you know the, the devil's lying? His lips are moving. He's the father of lies. Now, if by chance part one of his plan doesn't work and you end up coming to faith in Jesus Christ as a second part to his mission, you want to write this down. Part two is this, to deceive every believer in Jesus Christ and convince them to disobey God. Satan wants to convince us to make disobedient choices in our life. And he's absolutely ruthless in his pursuit to do that. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, not to tickle, not to delight. He wants to devour you. He wants to chew you up, spit you to the curve, step on you one last time, and walk away. That's what he wants to do. He sides up alongside of you like he really cares about you, like he really wants what's best for you. But the fact of the matter is, is he hates your stinking guts, and he will stop at absolutely nothing to try to destroy your life, to deceive you into not obeying God and his word. And he has zero mercy. He has zero compassion, zero pity, and zero grace. And he'll put his boot on your throat and leave it there. And as followers of Jesus Christ, he'll do anything and everything he can, barring any expense, to destroy your life, your family, your children, your grandchildren your job, everything. He wants to deceive us into making poor decisions that will destroy us and render our testimony impotent. But there is some good news. And listen to this good news, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, at the end of the age. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. The good news is he will be dealt with. The bad news is he's still alive and well on planet Earth until that time. So what then do you and I as followers of Jesus Christ need to do in order to withstand his attack. Let me give you three biblical principles here. Principle number one, do not dabble in the diabolical. Do not dabble in the diabolical. As a follower of Jesus Christ, I must never, ever, ever, ever underestimate the power of the devil's devices. James chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 5 and verse 27, 4, Ephesians 4 and verse 27, Give no opportunity to the devil. In other words... Do not allow the devil to have a foothold or a beachhead into your life. Let's say I want to go see Felix. So I go to his house. I knock on his front door. Most always the front door will swing in, right? Felix, not knowing it's me because he's mad at me. He doesn't like me. He's frustrated with me. He hates my stinking guts. He opens the door because he doesn't have a window to see that it's me. And he immediately gets ready once he sees it to me to shut the door. But guess what I do? I'm a smart, intelligent guy. I stick my foot in that door. 
He cannot shut that door. Therefore, he cannot lock that door. He cannot seal that door. He cannot keep me from pushing against the door. Felix, would you stand up for a second? Come here, brother. This is a, this is a strong, sturdy man. Strong, sturdy little man. <laughs> they come down very hard. They, they come do. down, yeah. <laughs> Big trees fall, make a lot of noise. But imagine, if I'm giving it all I got, pushing, trying to get in. He's fighting with everything. I've got the advantage because the door's open. Thank you, brother. You can sit down. Right? Good job. Great door. <laughs> Don't even dabble in the devil's stuff. By way of entertainment, games, stay away. Principle number two. Don't allow the devil to lure you into disobeying God. Don't allow the devil to lure you into disobeying God. Sometimes the devil will come to you and me. And he begins with questions. If God was really that good and that powerful, wouldn't he give you everything you wanted? I mean, come on. You're praying. You're asking. You've been living for God, trying your best, and he hasn't given you what you asked for. Let me say this to you this morning. If God hasn't given you what you have asked for yet, it's only because he knows it's not best for you. But the devil says, hey, um, come along with me, man. Well, we're in this together. I'll get you what you want. And many a man has fallen to his devices. The amazing thing is, is Satan has a very simple strategy. It's not that complicated. And that's what Ron's series this spring is all about. And I encourage you, don't miss a single one. Because he's so subtle. But yet he's so good at what he does. But listen to what God's word has to say about disobedience. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. God always links disobedience with consequences. We saw it when we studied David. Remember last year, we studied David's life. He made the willful choice to sin with Bathsheba. Was he forgiven when he asked for forgiveness? He certainly was, but the, the, um, the consequences were a part of his life and family for the rest of his life. So what do we do? Principle number three. We must use God's weaponry to resist Satan. We must use God's weaponry to resist Satan. We find God's rep, uh, weaponry in Ephesians 6. Verse 12 says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Spiritual warfare requires spiritual weaponry. And you can read all about that weaponry in Ephesians chapter 6, but we're not having time today to study all of that. So let me point out to you the singular offensive weapon of the weaponry that God lists for us here in Ephesians 6, and that's found in verse 17, where he says, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is the only offensive weapon 
He talks about a helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness. All of that is defensive weaponry. The only offensive weaponry is a sword. And the word sword there really means dagger. It's hand-to-hand combat. And it is the word of God. It's the same weaponry that Jesus used in Matthew chapter 4, when after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, Satan came to him with three tempting offers. And each and every time, Jesus responded with this response. It is written. And then he quoted to him a verse from the book of Deuteronomy. Three temptations. It is written. It is written. It is written. Three quotes from the word of God from the book of Deuteronomy. And then listen to what it says in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 4. Listen to this, guys. Then the devil left him. The point is the word works. And the only thing that'll chase the devil off of your doorstep and my doorstep and out of my mind and your mind is the word of God. And you gotta walk with Jesus. And the only way to walk with Jesus is to walk in his word. And you, when you walk in his word, you get his word into your heart and into your mind. And then the Holy Spirit when has something to work with when the devil comes. You don't want the devil to come and you think, oh, listen, I got to find a, a computer program to find a verse for this right now. Listen, you're too weak for that. You're not strong enough. You're going to falter. You're going to fail. You're going to break like a twig. You don't take the time then in the midst of temptation to find a verse. You always walk with God. That's why we do what we do here, one thing for men. We want to spur you to walk with God in his word so that the Holy Spirit has something to work with when the enemy comes knocking at your door. Now, listen, guys, I know what you're thinking this morning. Hutch, that's great. I agree with everything you said. But my problem is I've already let him lure me in. What am I to do? I'm going to give you the answer to that question as soon as we come back from the tables. Let's bring to the tables. So what do I do if the enemy has already gotten the upper hand? I've succumbed to his luring, and I find myself in a compromising bad position. What do I do? There's one word that the Bible says applies in this situation, and that is the word repent. The word repent is a is a changing of the heart and the mind that results in a change of action. It's the idea of I was walking this way towards that temptation and sin, and now I take a 180-degree response and walk away from it. So let me give you four steps to repentance, and I'd encourage you to find some space somewhere to write these four things down. Number one, confess your disobedience to God and ask him for his forgiveness. Confess your disobedience to God and ask him for forgiveness. That word confess means to say the same thing as. It's to look at your sin the way that God looks at it and say, God, your definition is right. Number two, renounce our wrong behavior and be willing to turn from it. 
renounce our wrong behavior and be willing to turn from it. It's one thing to say, I repent, but actions don't follow. That's just a word that's spoken. Number three, and this is important, go and make things right with anyone you have harmed. Go and make things right with anyone you have harmed. Number four, commit yourself with the help of God to obey God in this area of your life. Commit yourself with God's help to obey God in this area of your life. Now, to be quite honest with you, these things are easy to say, difficult to do. It takes a lot of courage to repent. It takes a lot of courage to say I was wrong. It takes a lot of courage to say, no, I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going to follow hard after God. But when you do, God promises to reward you. And when you do repent, he rewards you in two ways. Number one, he rewards you with forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't let those words slip by you. He is faithful and he is just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's forgiveness. But not only does he give us and reward us with forgiveness, but he also gives to us restoration. Joel 2.25, I will restore to you that which the locusts have eaten. And when you and I repent, not only do we enjoy the forgiveness of God, but God says, because you have had courage, because you have expressed faith, because you are my child and I see that you are making every effort to live for me, I want to reward you with forgiveness and restoration. What's the perfect example of that? The perfect example of that is the prodigal son. What did he do? He went out and blew it. But what was the father? And the father in the story of the prodigal son is God. The father is standing on the porch every day looking into the horizon, looking, waiting, hoping that his son would return. And all that son had to do was to crest the horizon. And the father gave the message, kill the fatted calf. Bad news if you're a fat calf. Good news if you're a prodigal son. Bring a ring. Bring a robe. He is going to be restored and forgiven. And he runs with open arms to receive you back. Now, let me tell you one last thing. You and I do not have to be afraid of the devil. 1 John 4, verse 4. Greater is he who is in you and me than he who is in the world. Ooh, that'll preach. Father, every single one of us is one step away from stupid. But by your grace, we're also only one step away from forgiveness and restoration. Lord, um, we have a very real enemy. 
You know him quite well. Today, as we've looked at the life of Moses, we have seen that uh, he's a crafty little son of a gun. But we can be aware of his craftiness. And we can prepare our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls, our spirits to fight the battle. Help us to this day find some time on the bench, as Ron would say, where we get into your word, but more importantly, allow your word to get into us. So that, Holy Spirit, you'll have something to work with when we are made keenly aware of the enemy of our soul's activity around us. We don't have to follow his lead. James says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. May it be the testimony of the men in this room and those who hear the sound of my voice that we can walk in the freedom that Jesus made available by his death on Calvary's cross and his resurrection from the grave. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. And greater is he who is in me. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in this world. Help us today to live that out for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, it's been good to see you this morning. Next week, Boyd Bailey is here. You will not want to miss Boyd. He always does such a superior job, and uh, man, we just love having him here. God bless. Hope you have a wonderful, victory-filled day today for God's glory.